Good morning, and welcome to Trinity Community Church. The only notice I've got before we begin is that Margaret Henry's husband died during the night, um, and I hope to go and see Margaret during the day. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us that your ways may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let's sing, let's worship God together in praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, that your love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies, that your justice is like the deep sea. Your unfailing mercies cannot be bought, but you give them freely to all who humble themselves before you. So we ask you that we might humble ourselves before you now, confessing our sins to you in the quiet. Father, we thank you that in Jesus we have the assurance of forgiveness and your power to maintain us on the right road. And we pray for those who, who don't know you. And may you be found today in unexpected places by unsuspecting people going about their daily lives. And may you also be found today in predictable places by inquisitive people searching for a different life. And may you be found today in this gathering of your people, for you will always be found in Jesus. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit on us. May we feast on your goodness and drink from the river of your blessing as we give you thanks through Jesus, your Son, our Lord. We've got somebody called Jezebel in our reading today, but she's not the Jezebel in the Old Testament. So I thought we would take a few minutes to look at Jezebel in the Old Testament because you can see why John names her after this person. Queen Jezebel was a princess from another country where they didn't worship the God of Israel. And she was married to King Ahab of Israel. In Israel, they were supposed to be loyal to the God of Israel. But she encouraged people to worship other gods and persecuted and killed a lot of the Lord's prophets. The prophets were the people who reminded others what God wanted. Now one day, King Ahab was looking out of his palace. And he was looking at the vineyard. That's a place where grapes are growing. And this vineyard belonged to Naboth. Now, King Ahab desperately wanted Naboth's vineyard. And so he went to him and demanded, give me your vineyard, I'll buy it from you, or I'll give you a better one somewhere else. <laughs> and if Martin is frightened by that, Naboth was surely a bit frightened by it as well. However... Naboth told him, I could never part with the vineyard. It's God's gift to my family. It's my inheritance. And I want to pass it on to my children and to their children and so on. But no matter how much the king pleaded, Naboth was not going to give up the vineyard. 
so Ahab was very upset and he was very, very grumpy because he couldn't get his way. Has, have you ever found that you've been like that? And so he stomped off to his bedroom to sulk. As a king, he was used to getting his what he wanted. But deep down he knew that in Israel, that kings were supposed to obey the law of God. And so he turned on his back and refused to eat. Now Queen Jezebel came in and she had a talk with him. She said, why are you so sad? Why are you not eating? And Ahab said, I want Naboth's vineyard and he won't give it to me. I offered to pay for it and give him another one, but he still wouldn't budge. And Jezebel said, you're the king, aren't you? <laughs> and she laughed. She knew that her dad, who was also a king, wouldn't stand for this obey the law stuff. Do you think she was right? Should kings and those in authority obey the law? Cheer up, she said. I'll get that vineyard for you. Now Jezebel had a cunning plan. She wrote letters in the king's name to the city leaders. And the letters told the city leaders to put Naboth on trial and accuse him of things he hadn't done. So Naboth and the city leaders were, were scared. And though they knew what was the right thing to do, they found it easier to do what was wrong. Have you ever found yourselves in that position? So Naboth was put on trial, and two rotten people that they found somewhere told lies about him. And they said he'd said bad things about God and about the king, and so he was found guilty. And the punishment in those days was death. And so the innocent Naboth was taken out and killed. Jezebel, well, she couldn't wait to tell Ahab. Naboth's dead. His vineyard's yours. But God had seen all that had happened. And Ahab's greed had led to innocent blood being shed. And God was very displeased at that. So he spoke to the prophet Elijah and he said, go and meet King Ahab in Naboth's vineyard. And God told Elijah what to say to the king. And Elijah set off at once. Elijah was God's prophet. And King Ahab was in Naboth's vineyard. And he was looking very happy. At last he'd got what he wanted. But Elijah's message to him struck him with horror. Dogs will lick your blood in the same place where Naboth died, the prophet declared to him. And Ahab at first was just very angry to see Elijah. He said, oh, it's my old enemy again. You've found me again. But Elijah was not put off by this. And he said to him, your whole royal family, your whole royal house is going to be wiped out. And Jezebel will end up as dog food. And Elijah went on telling God's judgment to the wicked king. And then Elijah turned and went home. Now Ahab was really shocked by what God had said. And he began to feel scared and sorry for what he'd done. 
He liked doing exactly what he wanted, but he didn't want to face the punishment that comes from disobeying God. And so he tried to show how sorry he was. He ripped his royal clothes and he put on horrible, scratchy, rough clothes instead. And he stopped eating. And God was pleased that the proud, wicked king had humbled himself and was sorry for the terrible things he'd done. So God told Elijah, Ahab is sorry, I've decided to hold back my punishment on his family until after he dies. And that's exactly what happened. And if you can hold this incident from the book of Kings in your mind when we come to talk about Jezebel, whom John calls the false prophet in the New Testament letter. But now we're going to sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, 10,000 reasons, and then followed by a version of Psalm 2, which we heard at the beginning. Um, Psalm 2 is very relevant to our reading today. In fact, Jesus quotes it in his message to the church in Thyatira. And sometimes as Christians, we can feel uncomfortable with language that seems triumphalistic. But the Bible is clear that those who set themselves against God will one day have to contend with the king he has chosen. And we must remember that Christians around the world face persecution from those who rage against God their maker. So let's stand to sing these two songs. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This morning's reading is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Write this to the angel in the church of Thyatira. The Son of God is saying these things. He is the one whose eyes that blaze like fire and feet like shining bronze. He says this to you. I know what you do. I know about your love, your faith, your servants, and your patience. I know that you're doing more now than you did at first. But I have this against you. You let that woman Jezebel do what she wants. She says she's a prophetess, but she's leaving my servants away with her teaching. Jezebel leads them to take part in sexual sins and to eat food that's offered to idols. I have given her time to change her heart and to turn away from her sin, but she doesn't want to change. And so I will throw her in a bed of suffering, and all those who take part in adultery with her will suffer greatly. I will do this now if they do not turn away from the wrong she does. I will also kill her followers. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who knows what people feel and think, and I will pay each of you for what you've done. But others of you in Tharatara have not followed her teaching. You've not learned what some call Satan's deep secrets. This is what I say to you. I'll not put any other load on you, only continue in the way you, you are until I come. I will give power to everyone who wins the victory and continue to the end to do what I want. I will give him power over the nations. You will make them obey you by punishing them with a rod of iron. You will break them into pieces like pottery. This is the same power I received from my father. I will also give him the morning star. Everyone who has ears should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this is a very stern passage to turn to in some ways. So please help me to expound it. Please send your Holy Spirit to me as I speak. And send your Holy Spirit to all of us as we listen and think about these things and as we seek to respond to it. In Jesus' name, we ask you. 
Amen. Thyatira, or Thyatira, was a much smaller city than the ones we've encountered so far in the Roman province of Asia. You can see it there, just south of Pergamon. You can't see so much of it now because the modern Turkish city of Akizar sits on top of it, and so it's only archaeological remains which have been recovered. Now, in the ancient world, it was a center of business trading and of making things. And Lydia, whose story we hear about in Acts 16, Lydia was in Philippi, where, where Paul met her, and she became one of their first converts in that city, and a church was formed around her. But she, she was originally from Thyatira. She was a trader in purple cloth, in luxury cloth made with purple dye, which the wealthy elites in the Roman Empire wore. But it wasn't just cloth dyeing that went on there. From a few inscriptions in the buildings that remain, we know that there were workers in wool and linen, there were leather workers and people involved in processing hides. There were potters, bakers, slave dealers, and bronze smiths. And all these people would have belonged to a trade guild. The trade guilds were business associations with considerable economic and social power. And they all had their own patron gods. Now, if believers in Jesus were to join any of these guilds, they would have been under tremendous pressure to participate in the worship of these patron gods and to attend feasts in the pagan temples or quasi-religious feasts in the trade halls with food that had been offered to idols. And these feasts often degenerated into sex parties with the temple prostitutes. And if they refused to join the guilds, then they would have suffered both financially and socially. So you see, People in Thyatira, as in other parts of Asia Minor and other parts of the Roman Empire, had a choice to make. If they wanted to follow Jesus, they had a choice of how much they were going to be involved in their society. And we all have a choice to make as Christians of how much we are involved in our society. But there's a difference between a godly compromise and an ungodly compromise. Because if we're not involved at all in our society, then we won't make any, we won't have anything distinctive to say to that society. But if we're too much involved in it, then we're in danger of compromising our allegiance to Christ by the way we live and the things we do. In Acts 15, a church council is meeting in Jerusalem to decide the question of how Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentile believers in Jesus could possibly be included in the same body and eat from the same table. And they came up with a solution so that Gentile believers should not have a heavy load to carry. That's what they say. They don't want to impose burdens on the Gentile believers because they believe that their faith is genuine. But they made these four demands to them. Four things to avoid because they happened in pagan temples. 
as the New Testament scholar Ben Witherington has shown. Now, two of these things are our cultural practices, but the other two are more lasting injunctions. They say to them, don't eat any food that's been offered to idols, and don't take part in any kind of sexual sin. And that's possibly what Jesus is referring to. Jesus whose eyes are a flaming fire and his feet are like burning bronze in John's vision. He says to the Christians at Thyatira, I won't put any other load on you. Remember? The council in Jerusalem said they wouldn't have a heavy load to carry. But I won't put any other load on you. But it's quite clear that these issues are still bothering the Christian community in Thyatira and in the other cities in the Roman province of Asia. The issues of eating food, of joining in the temple feasts, and the issues of being led into sexual immorality. In Thyatira, the problem is being brought to a head by a female prophet that John calls Jezebel. I don't think that's actually her name. Jewish people don't generally call their children after wicked rulers in the Bible. Um, and it's symbolic. The name is actually symbolic of what she's doing and teaching. Because the historic Jezebel, well, she was glad to introduce pagan practices into Israel. And she encouraged the people to commit spiritual adultery. That's what the prophets call it again and again. When they leave their loyalty to the God who rescued them out of Egypt, and they go, as the prophets said, they go a-whoring after other gods. And all that fits this anonymous New Testament leader. And in case anyone thinks, thinks this is the case, the problem is not with her being a woman. Though Jezebel has sometimes been used as a name, usually by men, to stigmatize women's word ministry in the church. And I would remind you that there are quite a few women in the Old Testament and the New who are celebrated as prophets. Peter, on that first day of Pentecost, quotes the prophet Joel, and he says, this is what's happening. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and your daughters. So the problem with Jezebel in the New Testament is not that she's a woman, it's that she's a false prophet. She's leading people astray. Jesus says, she's leading my servants away with her teaching. Jezebel leads them to take part in sexual sin to commit fornication in the old translation and to eat food that is offered to idols. And that's the major problem in this church in Thyatira. Now there's much that Jesus praises he says, I know what you do. I know about your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. I know that you're doing more now 
than you did at first. And so that's a big tick that comes from Jesus. These are practically the, the, the list of Christian virtues which, which Paul would love to see in his churches. That's what Tom Wright says. But Jesus also says, I have this against you. You let that woman, Jezebel, do what she wants. Now, what exactly is Jezebel's message? Well, it isn't terribly clear. But from the other churches and the... We hear about the Nicolaitans and about the people who are going after the sin of Balaam. Well, it takes some kind of imagination to reconstruct, so maybe it's like something like this. She's probably saying, it doesn't really matter what you do, as long as inside, in your spirit, you remain pure. You've been baptized, you're safe. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. You must get to know this, this deep, deep wisdom, which doesn't come to everybody. It's ordinary Christians, they don't really understand this. And if they say, you mustn't do this, it just shows how unenlightened they are. Join in with the train guilds and do what they do. It can't harm you. It's just a bit of fun. And it shows that you're, you're up for it. God wants to prosper us after all. And he's not going to ask you to run away from these things. But Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says exactly that. He says, run away from sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. And he's speaking to a Christian community with exactly the same problems. The temptation to indulge in the idol feasts, which the pagans called holy feasts, by the way. That's a Christian name for it. And the temptation to think that you can commit sexual sins and God doesn't care. And Paul says, run away from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person does is outside the body, but those who are sexually immoral sin against their own bodies. And Jesus speaks against these deep secrets, because that's what Jezebel called them, presumably, but which he labels as satanic. And he says, I've given her time to change her heart and turn away from her sin, but she doesn't want to change. Now remember, in our story from the Old Testament. Remember how even when King Ahab, when he showed himself sorry for his unjust actions, and he was willing to repent of them, God showed him grace. Even though Ahab's change of heart didn't last very long, although it was sincere, And so fearful judgment remained on him and his royal house, even though God postponed it till after Ahab was dead. And it will be the same with this New Testament Jezebel and her followers. And dare I say, it will be the same 
in our church. To the faithful in Thyatira, Jesus says through his prophet John. We've got a rather flat reading in, um, in the version which we chose. Continue the way you are until I come. And a better translation would be hold on tightly to what you have until I come. And the New Testament professor Tom Wright says this. That is a word for all those Christians today who find themselves in churches and fellowships where teaching and behavior which they know is not the way of the Messiah is being eagerly embraced and hailed as God-given. And what is offered to those Christians who hold on tightly is one day to share in Christ's power and authority over the nations. That's something you find in, in the Jewish teaching about the Messiah and in the Christian teaching. You find it in a, a rhyme which Paul quotes in his first letter to Timothy in chapter 2 where he says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And Christ promises the gift of the morning star. That's a traditional emblem of the victory of light over darkness. It was the morning star, it's actually a planet appears in the sky just before the dawn is going to come. And which in Revelation 22 is revealed as a picture of Jesus himself. I am the root and the offspring of David. In other words, I am God's chosen king. And I'm the bright morning star. Because one day dawn is coming. Dawn is coming, the dawn of a new heaven and a new earth to this planet, dark though it may be at times. Let's pray. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Father, please help us in making choices of what we're going to do or not do in our society, of what we're going to approve of or not approve of in our society. Because these things haven't gone away. They're just coming back to us in another form. Help us to be among those who hold fast to Christian truth and Christian behavior. No matter what happens, strengthen us to endure. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to sing, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and we're going to sing it to the tune of the Rowan Tree. This morning, I'm hoping that the whole congregation can be involved in the prayer for others. And you might want to to do this with your neighbor or just on your own. I'll start our prayers in sections for our world, this country, this community, the church, friends and family, 
and ourselves. And I'll leave a space between each one of them um, for you to speak out silently or use words, kind of keeping the reflections in mind or using words from songs or just listen to whatever pops into your head. A few words is all that's needed. Dear Lord, you have created an amazing, beautiful world, and we do not have enough words to thank and praise you. We give to you this morning just a token of what you give us with our offering. And we pray that um, you will bless this and it be used for furthering your kingdom. There are people hurting all over the world who need to know your blessing and comfort today and many who don't know you at all. We lift them up to you now with our prayers. Father, we now speak to you about people, places and services in this country who we don't know, but you do. Thank you for listening to the prayers we bring. Lord, your church is alive, but we hear so many negative stories about declining numbers and hurts caused. We lift those prayers to you now. Lord God, there are people close to all of us who need to know your blessing or your healing touch. We bring our friends and family to you now. Finally, Father, we bring ourselves to you and we'll end with the family prayer. But thank you for all our blessings and for listening and answering all the prayers which we bring to you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We sing our final song. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. There is also prayer ministry at the back of the church, and if you'd like to be involved in more prayer about things in our church, then come along to our prayer meeting at 7.15 p.m. in the hall. You know very well, Martin, where it is, because <laughs> you're a more regular attender than, than most of us. Uh, Father, please help us as we go forth. And may your blessing be upon us, the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one almighty God, be present with us in our lives this day and every day. Amen.